wonderful to be here and share my story with you all. Um, I know it's hard to stop talking. Huh? It's so exciting to be here. This is actually such an amazing um, journey of coming out of polygamy to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Um, knowing that it's by him I'm saved and not by being a polygamous wife. Um, I, I, I've been praying about how to, what stories to tell. There's so many things to share. There's so many heartaches I could go into. I could go into the sexual abuse I went through in polygamy um, with one of the leaders in the, the order. I could go into... Um, uh, I could go into the abuse of my childhood, but what I really want to focus on and um, is what Jesus has done in my life since I've come out. And I, I'm going to take you on the, the journey of me coming out um, <clears throat> and finding Jesus as Lord and Savior and, and God of my life. Um, I never knew who God was. I was very confused as a polygamist because Adam was God. We were taught Adam is God. And I never, I, I, I asked my husband to explain it. Who is God? Is he Jehovah? Is he, I never ever imagined Jesus was God. I would never heard that. So to, to find out who God really is, and just like Thomas said, you know, he fell on his knees and he said, my Lord and God. Um, I read it multiple times in the Bible. Emmanuel is God with us. Um, he's in Isaiah. It talks about He is wonderful, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and mighty God, everlasting Father. I had never seen it before, and and you know I gave my life to Jesus because um, I. God called me. When the shofar was blown today, I, I knew that's the story I needed to share. And I have never shared it before because it's it's almost like supernatural. But um, I left my husband in 2014 after we found out that the leader was um, a pedophile. I just thought this is no different than Warren Jeff's group. And I should not be here. And I've always wanted to leave. And I've been suicidal most of my marriage. And <clears throat> I just, I, God literally picked me up and took me out. And But I went into the Mormon church thinking that that's where, you know, it was the, that, the nest best, the nest best thing. <laughs> and... Um, so I was there for nine months. Uh, my husband ended up filing for a divorce. And um, of course, we were not legally married. So it was just a, an agreement where he told me we were never married. We never cohabitated. And we had no common law marriage. He had no legal obligation to me. And this was after 25 years of marriage. Um, he wanted all the kids as dependents on his tax return. I said, whatever you want. This is on you. This is for you and God. And I'll just sign whatever you want to do. <clears throat> I didn't fight him on anything. I didn't argue with him. Um, and, and I left. Um, got into another relationship with a Mormon and was going to get married in the temple. And praise God, that fell apart big time. All he wanted was one thing, like a lot of guys do. And I was very vulnerable and lonely. And, you know, um, so yeah, I had made some pretty bad choices um, because of that. So I went back to the group feeling like they, I needed to go back to my husband. I told him everything I did. Please forgive me. The leader said, I don't know if you can be forgiven. I don't know if God can forgive you. And um, uh, he said, maybe in a 10,000 years, she might be forgiven. Well, this, I literally 
when I left that day, they excommunicated me, said my marriage was null and void. I started to scream. It just ripped my spirit apart. I drove all the way an hour drive back home up to late in Utah and from the Bluffdale uh, group. And um, I just screamed the whole way. It was like I had been shred. My heart had been shred. I, I cried out um, to God and I knew he couldn't forgive me because that's what they had told me. I believed him. And I was just like, I have to kill myself. I literally felt like, because I've been taught about this blood atonement. So I went crazy. I literally lost my mind for a month. I couldn't sleep hardly at all. I couldn't eat. I started, uh, the anxiety was so severe. I started rocking and crying. And, and I'd wander at night and just, I can't be forgiven. I've committed the unpardonable sin. I started studying online, so I was constantly on the phone, which isn't good for you, I'm sure, and looking up all the blood atonement garbage of Mormonism and the stories I found, and I was shocked. The men would kill their wives, um, slit their throats. Come here, darling, let me, uh, let me do you a favor and slit your throat so you don't go to hell. A blood atonement really happened, and so this drove me to more convincing I needed to take my own life. Um, the day I planned to do it, my daughter came or came home from school the day before and said, Mom, one of my friends at school walked in front of the subway and killed himself. And I literally was like, that's what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm going to do it. I'm going to just drive over there and walk in front of that subway and take my own life. And I heard that morning when I woke up, like I couldn't sleep. I, I'd get like little hours or little minutes. And I woke up and I heard the shafar blowing 30 times. And I remember, I remember in Revelations it talks about the trump blowing or something. And all of a sudden I heard, I hear God's voice say, I heard God's voice audibly say, I will take you by the right hand and lead you into all truth. And I thought I was in the truth, right? And I just was like, I thought this was the truth. And I didn't understand it. But my mom had been praying for me for 30 years. She had become a Christian when I was 15. She had left. Ray Gerber and um, become a Christian. And she had prayed for 30 years for me. She, it broke her heart to know I was in polygamy. It broke her heart to know that I was suffered and I was very vocal about my suffering to my mom. I was just like, I hate it, it's hard, but God has required this, you know. And she'd send me little like books, um, con kids conversion books for her grandkids and I'd read them. And it was so light and beautiful. And I, you know, I can just see how God was moving the whole time I was in polygamy. I love Focus on the Family. Uh, James Dobson was a Christian uh, minister or psychologist. And Focus on the Family was just wonderful because uh, I take things to my husband. And I'm like, hey, why don't we try this? Like, um, oh, we don't do that. You know, he, he would listen, but... And nothing changed. We were not really allowed to go to a psychologist or get help or a therapist. We, it was all about the group and staying, you know, in the group. And because my, they groomed my husband, he came in from the Mormon church, and then they groomed him and actually called him to the council in 2012. In 1992, I went back um, to the polygamous group after being gone for seven years. In 92, that's when, and Doris mentioned it in the Aura group, that's when I heard over the pulpit Lynn Thompson speak and say, there'll come a day when we will have to sleep with our daughters to keep the lungs pure. This was before I was married. So all of that stuff really, everything she's saying really happens. And he did mention a lot. And I remember being so furious in that meeting. It was in Salt, uh, Bluffdale, Utah. 
I was so furious because no one got up. All one didn't get up and correct him. There was no one that got up. So I actually years later said, why did they teach that? And Steve Murphy, who is very doctrinal, he was like, oh, because that's what we believe. We believe that um, that there's there's a doctrine that just like God came and slept with Mary, you know, that it's like that will happen someday. That's the, that's the man's um, privilege. Anyway, um, so when I heard that show far, my friends that morning, I literally was going to kill myself. I'll get back to this. And um, I heard the cops were coming. My, my, my friend came and said, the cops are coming to take you away. And uh, we know you need help. I, I, what, what I did was I grabbed my baby. He was about, I think, three at the time. And I just started rocking him uncontrollably. I could not hold still. I, the anxiety and I just needed to hold somebody. And this was a year, I think, about 10 months after I left my husband. And I just held him and just wouldn't let him go. And they they call, had called the cops. And and I kept going, I, I, I have to die. You know, I have to die. I have to kill myself. This really happens, the torment and the trauma to multiple women that come out. Um, the fear of going to hell. And um, I, w I went into the hospital for two weeks. And... Um, I knew God couldn't forgive me. I mean, that was the, the ultimate craziness. I knew Jesus could not forgive me, and I wouldn't pray. I would not pray. Finally, um, I think that's what helped, what helped me get out. Is finally, I I I said, God, I did. I cried out to Him after I couldn't sleep for nine days straight. I would walk the floor day and night. They had like a circle in the unit, and I just walked all day, all night. I wouldn't eat. They basically told me they were going to force feed me if I didn't start eating. Um, <clears throat> so finally, they started trying to put me on some di different drugs. I came out on drugs uh, that, that helped me kind of calm down, and they gave me something because I was shaking all the time. I was literally could not hold still, and, or I just rock, 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 rock because of this anxiety, and I wanted to jump out a window, I wanted to end my life, the whole time I was there, and they said, they they gave me this, uh, I don't even remember the drug, but it was so wonderful, because I was just calm. I was like, oh, I feel normal again. I want more of that, whatever that was, I want more of that. And they're like, we can never give you that again, because it's so addicting, wow. it is so highly addicting. And and I just said, I just feel normal. I just feel calm. And I want, and they're like, no, but there's some other things we can give you that aren't quite as addicting. Um, anyway, um, it was funny because all their group therapy that I went into, I just thought, no, this it just it makes the anxiety more increasing. And God was trying to get me to turn to Him. God was trying to, to, to get. Uh, gave, you know, woo me to him. And finally, because it, it wasn't helping, <laughs> they did was not helping. So I finally, while I was there, I cried out to God and I just said, I, I think I need you. I think I need you because nothing is helping here. None of the drugs they gave me, nothing was helping. And and, and God heard that that prayer. And, um, and my journey is so amazing because my brother, or my son's, my sons came and told me, Mom, this is all of your religious dogma that you've heard. My sons, who had also come out of the group, um, and they just said, this is, this is what's happening. This is what's going on in your mind. And, you know, God just as gently led me and, and showed me through people. And um, I went back to the group. I had to put my kids back in the school. I knew I had to follow the leader and... So for four years, I stayed in that group. And one day, I was driving to um, home, and I turned on the radio. I'd never even heard of Christian this Christian radio, 820 AM. I turned it on, and I hear Doris Hansen on it. And she says, she was, it was a little commercial, and it just said, polygamy, what love is this? You know, she's advertising, and I just, it, it pierced my heart, I, it, I heard it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is not love, 
There's no love in polygamy. My father never told me he loved me. The leaders of the group never told their own children. This is what shocked me, because I was very close to some of the All Reds and All Red boys, and they said they their father, Owen All Red, never told them their whole life that he loved them. Well, my father never did either. And it just shocked me. There's no love there. And my husband, he really didn't love me. I was a tool to get him to a higher degree. Um, and my husband ended up becoming one of the top leaders of the group. They put him in leadership as second in command when Lemoyne Jensen died. He was second to the Lynn Thompson, the leader. No one knows all this, but they groomed him because he was wealthy, he was smart, he was he had a college degree, he was great, uh, you know, for the outside world. Uh, he was so my husband really was groomed to be one of the, the leaders. And they told him that Marvin Jessup couldn't be a leader and that he was the one that was supposed to be next, but God actually took his life. He ended up passing away uh, five years um, later and dying before he could become the leader, which I think is fascinating because they try to put people in places and arrange things, but God is in control. And um, so I hear Doris Hansen, and that's when things really started shaking I, I went home, I started listening to this Christian radio, and I was so scared my kids weren't there. I, I turn it off, because these people, these pastors in Utah will actually confront Mormonism, Mormon doctrine. There's MRM Ministries with Bill McKeever, and I started just listening and just in shock that someone's actually contradicting Mormonism. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that they have the guts to do that. Like, we were never allowed to contradict and so I flip it on when my kids weren't in the car, and as soon as I pick them up from school, I turn it off. Oh, they can't know this. They're like, oh, what if that might lead them astray? You know? And so basically, I just um, slowly started looking into Christianity, and I came across a podcast from a woman named Lynn Wilder. And she reached out. She said, if there's anyone there who can't afford my book, I've written a book called Unveiling Grace. Please call me. I want to send it to you for free. I'm like, I'm calling her. I'm going to call her on Facebook. I call her and say, I need your book. I'm actually, I have no money. I'm barely surviving. And uh, I, would love, I would love your book. And so I said, I'm in polygamy. And um, she said, do you mind if I give your number to Doris Hansen? And I haven't heard of Doris Hansen. I didn't even know really, I heard her name, but I didn't know who she was. I'm like, no, I don't mind. She's like, she's actually also come out of polygamy. And she has an outreach for polygamists. And um, so she ended up hooking me up with Doris Hansen. She sent me her book and I read it. I, I love books. I love reading. I always have. I read it very quickly, and it was New Year's Eve. I finished 2019. I finished that book. So January 1st, I decided to give my life to Jesus because uh, she said she had to. She literally laid on the floor and just said, "I don't know you, but I want to know you, and I don't know what this means, but I want to give my life to you." So I did the same thing in the shape of a cross. I laid down and gave my life to Jesus and said, I don't know what this is me means or what you're going to do with me, but I want to give my life to you. And he he said, well, you're going to have to tell your husband. <laughs> <laughs> now, they had just told me after four years of waiting that I could be rebaptized and, and be with my husband. They wouldn't let me, us be together for four years. When he couldn't even come for dinner. There was no... I could see him at church, and that was it. And so they had just told me. And everything in me wanted to go back to him. I loved him. I missed him. I wanted to work things out. But Jesus said, um, what's that scripture where it says, "Leave those who you leave your father and mother, it, I'll, I'll give you a hundredfold. Because I knew if I left, I'd leave my family, everyone I knew, everyone I loved. I'd lose my rep reputation. And I knew I'd lose lose everything I had.
but God said, you have to lose your life to, to find it. And so tell your husband, this is it. Confess. Another thing is confess my name before men. Um, if you confess, you know, what was that scripture? Help me out. Confess and believe. You know which one I'm talking confess about? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Yeah, and that's the scripture he gave me. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you will be saved. Believe in your heart. And believe in your heart. So that's kind of what was happening. Of course, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand all of this, but my husband comes and drops off the kids. January 1st, 2019, he had had them for New Year's Eve, and he comes in and gives me a hug, and isn't it exciting, you get, get baptized today. soon, have you called the baptismal man, you know, the bishop, to get, because they gave me the number, they were all excited, and I just said, Jesus told me not to get baptized. <laughs> And they're like, he's like, what? I said, I gave my life to Jesus today, and he told me I'm not supposed to get baptized. And he said, what? You don't believe in Joseph Smith anymore? And I said, and I've been praying all morning, God, give me the words to know what to say to my husband. And literally, the words just flew out of my mouth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And my husband went, like, his mouth dropped open. He could not say anything, right? He couldn't fight against the truth. And then he goes, you don't believe in the Book of Mormon anymore? He was just shocked. Because I'd been for four years trying to come back. And in an instant, God turned me. I did that U-turn. <laughs> I repented, right? Um, I repented of the sinful life I, I had lived for you, 26 years. Um, and... My, I said, I don't, I loved the Book of Mormon. I did. I still, I don't understand it. I didn't know that the Bible was really where the truth was. I didn't know all that. So for that whole year, my husband ended up with cancer. He got cancer a month later, and everything in me wanted to go back for that whole year. It was the biggest battle. You know, you give your life to Jesus, and then the battle really begins. And I kept telling Doris, too, Oh my gosh, I want to go back. I don't know. I'm going to hell. I know I'm going to hell. I mean, you're so full of fear. And uh, Doris would say, you need to get into a Bible study, Karen. You need to get into a Bible study. And she'd meet with me in April Wido and several times, and we talked. And it was just like it wasn't sticky. Um, but God told me to quit my job. I got into the Bible. I started reading the Bible. And it came alive to me. I was just couldn't get enough of it. Uh, but, and I'm going to go through uh, <laughs> some of the scriptures. Like my, So back to my husband, he said, go and tell the leader. You need to have another meeting with the leaders. And I'm like, I'm not going back to them. Like, God told me not to go back, and I'm not going back. And he said, well, I'm going to have him call you, uh, Paul Hess. So Paul calls me, and he says, why aren't you getting baptized? What's going on? I gave my life to Jesus. Um, he, he's like, what, where are you coming from? Are you crazy? You're leaving it all for Jesus? <laughs> and I just said, Paul, have you read the Bible? I said, in the Bible it says that the law and the prophets were done away with. In the Bible it says that, <laughs> this is the one that really shook me up, that the ordinances and the, the law is nailed to the cross that those who are under a law are under sin that, and under a curse and, and under obligation. And I just, he was just like, what Bible are you reading? <laughs> he never heard this kind of stuff. Because we don't read the Bible as polygamists. You don't really read the Bible. They pick and choose what they want to read. I never read the Bible until I was 45. And I was, uh, we were, you're staunch. You are doing it for God. You're doing all you do for God, but you don't even know who God is. And so God revealed himself through his word to me. And the, the really one that shook me up was 2 Timothy 2, 5, where it says, There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the Lord Christ Jesus. And I read that, and I'm like, what? Hallelujah! <laughs> Hallelujah! I don't have to go through Lynn Thompson to get to heaven! I, I mean, 
the Bible was just living water. I had never had living water in my life. I couldn't get enough of the Bible. I wanted it day, night. I mean, I, I didn't have a job, so I literally would listen to Doris Hansen's videos. <laughs> and it was wonderful. I just turned it on and lay in bed. And he said, rest. I want you to rest and heal in me. God also told me in Isaiah uh, 54, when they told me I didn't have a husband, he had told me that same day, I will be your husband. He just started to love me. I had never been loved in my life. He started to love me through his word. He sort of started to speak to me and my heart through his word. And he said, uh, you are my beloved. And I felt his love pour into my heart like it never done before. I was becoming a new cre I was a new creation. I was a new creation. All old things had passed away. I, I was new. I was set free. And the journey, he said, I want you to go to Montana. This is after I had become a Christian. Go to Montana. My sister was in the hospital. Catherine, because of all the abuse, a lot of my family just go, they went, a few of them just lost their mind, really. They were all on medications and a lot of trauma um, from our childhood. And so Kathy was in the hospital. Go visit your sister. So I go up there. Oh, actually, was that? Yeah, and I stayed at David Burt's house with my brother Phil. Remember that? That's the first time I came to this church. I just become a Christian. And I just love the worship music. I mean, anytime I went to a Christian church, I just start crying. Because it, it was speaking to my heart like ne nothing else. Yeah, they have drums and there's just joy. And I just couldn't help but like praise God. And chains started falling off of fear. Of the fear of man or what people thought of me just started falling to the ground. And so I come up here and I um, stayed with David and came here. It was such a wonderful experience. And then the next, um, that was in the summer, the next, then my husband died that year. And this is an amazing story because I witnessed to him. He, he had cancer and our relationship was restored. There was so much bitterness and anger I had. Every time I'd get with him before I was Christian, it was just reminding him of what a horrible husband he'd been. But it changed, and I just started telling him about Jesus and what Jesus had done for me. And, and our relationship, it was like all that forgiveness filled my heart for him, and I had compassion for him. And he'd come to my house, and we would just sit and talk. And um, there was just a love that started growing, and it, it was a pure love of Christ. And it, the most amazing experience was that I was able to be with him before when he died. Like, God lined that up. I'd have seven kids with him, and I loved him. And God healed our relationship so we could have that. And three days before he died, I went to him, and he said, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you. And I said, Jesus already did. You know Jesus already did that. You don't have to. And he, he said, but you have to keep all the commandments, too. And the Spirit literally, you know, the Holy Spirit teaches us. And I didn't know the scripture was Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but the, the Lord brought that, and you mentioned that this morning, Pastor. Um, it is by grace, we through faith we are saved, not of our works that no man should boast. That was what popped in my head. And it was like God was teaching me, you know, you're a new Christian, and he's teaching you. Um, and then I, I was able to sing. I said, well, I always wanted to sing with my husband. He, liked, he loved to sing, but there was so much fear in my heart. I was afraid to sing with anyone. And um, I said, can we sing together? And I said, what, what songs would you like to sing? So we sang um, Come Thou Found together. And then he was so weak, and he couldn't sing. And I said, can I sing one, one last song? And I sing Amazing Grace to him. And he died two days later. And I hope that he is saved. I mean, 
I, I hope that something stuck. Um, I just, my heart goes out to the polygamist men and women because they're, they're coerced and lied to from the time they're little that if they don't, they don't live this way, that they will go to hell. Um, and so I started um, going to Doris. Well, Doris Hansen actually invited me to come with her and one day to speak. And she spoke in front of a huge congregation. And I was weeping the whole time. I was just weeping as I heard her speak. And because I knew, knew what she was saying was true. And um, I ended up getting baptized a year ago. But, oh, oh yeah, I have to go back. Doris started a Bible study with me. For two years, we, we have done a Bible study together. That was the best thing because Doris knew how to, exactly what I was thinking, because she's been taught the same kind of garbage I had, so she knew how to help me see through it. And, and just being mentored and tutored, it was such a blessing to me. It, it really changed my life. And then um, I was praying, God, what do you want me to do with my life now? What, what do you want me to do? I mean, I just want to be, I want to tell people about Jesus, you know? And all of a sudden, he just opened it up where Doris invited me to go to Nebraska with her. And I got that. The most amazing thing is I wanted to get baptized, but I didn't know when it would happen. And so last March 21st, first day of spring, which is a beautiful time to be baptized, I was at Adventure Church, and uh, the pastor spoke on baptism. And she had a baptismal font, and the Spirit said, this is your day to be baptized. Well, in the congregation was Paul Hess, his wife, and multiple of his children because their their um, son's baby was getting, I don't know how the Christians do it, not christened, but they bless the child and, and they there's a special ceremony they do. I don't know, it's not a ceremony, but just like everyone, the congregation was blessing this child, so all of these polygamists were there. And they were my friends. Um, it was amazing. It was like God is so, everything he does is for a purpose. And so I end up, okay, I literally have no baptism apples. The pastor's like, I got some t-shirts here. If you guys want to get changed, if anyone wants to be baptized, I'm like, okay, I'm going to look like a fool, but it's all for Jesus. So I don't care how I look. Like, like Dora says, it's never, you're never a fool. And so I get in a t-shirt, I go up and all of a sudden I was like, God wanted me to speak. And just, so I said, you know, I, I came out of polygamy. I, I came to Christ and he started leading me places. Um, he, he wanted me to tell people about him. In fact, I went all the way to Missoula, Montana on one of my journeys, and the Lord told me to buy this devotional for this woman at the Crackle Barrel restaurant, and I, I was like, no way, this is embarrassing, no, you need to do it. I, I went back, bought this book, gave it to this woman, and I'm telling this quick story, and, and the woman says, she, she said, oh my goodness, I walked away from Jesus 10 years ago. I said, well, he wants you to know he loves you, and he wants you to come home. And she started weeping and just telling me how she had really gone into the New Age movement and walked away from Jesus. And so God was just showing me there's people everywhere that need to know he loves them. He has a purpose in their, for them in their life. And I said, and I used to be in polygamy, and I thought that's how I got to heaven. And, um, and I thought it would make me more sanctified and more righteous. And I lived this. It would purge out the dross. But I found out it's... it's through faith. The faith in Jesus is what sanctifies me. That's how I'm sanctified and purified and made clean and holy. And it's so simple, it's so beautiful. Come to Jesus. And then I, the, the woman that was there that was a polygamist, she, her husband's also one of the top leaders of the group. He was my husband's best friend. And she was just sitting there with her sons. And I, I know she was really um, taken back 
by what happened. And then I asked her son to baptize me. Her son was the one that shared Jesus with me when I did go back. Her son was at one of the parties, and he was a druggie, tattooed up, piercings, and he came to Jesus, and then he came and told me about it, coming to Jesus, and he was so full of joy and how he changed his whole life. And so I was like, I want you, I want Heber to baptize me. And she was just like, what is going on, right? This is so un unusual. And Heber said, you just shocked me. Well, I didn't think you'd ask me to baptize you. But it's amazing how God just brings us new family, new friends. And then after I got baptized, I literally, for the first time in my life, felt like I had a family. I was a part of this family, and I called David Burt, and I and, and said, I am, I'm, we're family. Like, I, I, God said he's going to take me to this whole nation, and I'm starting to meet my Christian brothers and sisters. Like, he's got such a big family for me to meet, and I'm so excited. You know, my whole life I was looking for Father's love and for a family, and I found it in Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's I think sometimes we misuse words that uh, really are appropriate only in certain circumstances. Awesome. Wow, that wave was awesome. Wow, that burger was awesome. Wow, that movie was awesome. No, God's awesome. God's awesome. Everything falls short of that. And so uh, this, this uh, concludes the conference. Uh, we are meeting at 2 o'clock in the back building in the activity center. Um, one of the things that I feel like God has laid on my heart actually several years ago, uh, but that God has really been bringing up in me, uh, is that God does, God loves Pinesdale, loves the people of Pinesdale. God's heart is for the people of Pinesdale. And they're lost, and they're deceived, and they're in the darkness. And, and I believe with all my heart that God wants to show his love to the people of Pinesdale. Um, I don't know how God wants to use me. I don't know how God wants to use Jesus Community Church in this. Um, I was sharing this morning the first time I got to... <laughs> I remember as a teenager watching a movie... Uh, I, I think it was Helen Hunt, but she was a, a girl in a polygamous community. And I remember watching this movie as a teenager and thinking it was weird because there were cars. Because I thought polygamy ended in like, you know, 17, 1800s. And, you know, they're driving cars in this movie and there's polygamy. And I didn't understand that. But I really, it really did not come to my, my thinking until I moved to Montana. 1993 uh, and then I was told about Pinesdale and uh, the church that I was involved with at the time had a ministry trying to reach into Pinesdale and and I went several times uh, to to a family up there and, and I it, it didn't work it didn't work because it's not an intellectual problem <clears throat> it's not it's not a matter of who knows more it's a matter of the Spirit of God preparing the soil and drawing. And uh, Doris said this morning, you know, <clears throat> some of them plant the seeds, some water the seeds, some of them, we can pull the weeds, but it's God that brings the increase, and, and it's God that brings the increase in this. And so I, I don't know what, how God wants to use me, how God wants to use Jesus Community Church to minister to Pinesdale. So at 2 o'clock today, um, we're going to meet in the activity center, and we're, we're going to brainstorm. Uh, I, I had the um, great privilege to meet uh, two women last night that uh, are still in Pinesdale. They have both come to faith. Uh, they're both Christians. Um, the, the stories that they shared with me, wow. Mm -hmm. 
Um, wow. Um, they're in a place where they need help. You're stuck. Um, and I don't know how to help them. And so at 2 o'clock, we're going to meet together in the back building. We're going to start looking objectively at how we can help. Um, you know, it's, it's, I believe in praying for big things because I believe we have a big God. Um, mm -hmm. But we forget that God always deals with the individual. Mm -hmm. He deals with us one-on-one. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I remember when I first came to this valley, the church I was involved with would say, we're taking this valley for Jesus. Well, the valley's already his. <laughs> and, and, but the, the thing that we've got to remember is that God always deals with the individual. They might be a 5,000 in one setting, but it's always an individual. When I came to faith, it was at a Billy Graham crusade. My mom, actually, awesome. I didn't know this at the time, but my mom had left the Mormon church. She had been excommunicated. I didn't know it was the Mormon church. It was church. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was very little. Me and my two brothers uh, were brought in when she went to tell the elders that uh, she was leaving. We had our little slack shorts and our hair slicked back with dippity doo <laughs> and we sat on this bench and one of the ladies gave me a tiger's milk bar which i still don't to this day i don't know what a tiger's milk bar is but she gave it to me and i ate it and uh and then uh she talked to us kids about uh this 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 new relationship she had did you want it i had no clue what she was talking about it but i love my mom and i said yeah ooh. i don't know what we just did but when we were at the Billy Graham crusade and I listened to him talk, now keep in mind I'm, I'm six, uh, seven years old. And uh, <clears throat> when he gave the invitation, I knew that I wanted what they had. And they invited us, it was Jack Murphy Stadium, thousands and thousands of people. And my parents let me go down. <laughs> I, I still, to this day, I'm not really sure what was going on in their minds, but here I go, I mean, down onto the field of Jack Murphy Stadium, and I meet with the counselor, and I give my heart to the Lord, and they gave me this little book, and I got to, to, to do this little workbook, and I was so excited because when I got it finished, I got to mail it in, and they sent me a certificate, and, and, and uh, but I was, I was down on that ground, but it was me and God. There were hundreds of people around me. And there were hundreds of people that were making a profession of faith. But in that moment, it was me and God. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 2 o'clock this afternoon, <laughs> I would invite you to come if you want to participate. We're going to talk about possible uh, ways that we can be effective in ministry. Um, uh, there's so much more that can be done and needs to be done. Uh, it's so much bigger than I, I had ever thought. Um, but... We have a big God. Mm -hmm. and, and God, I, I always tell my congregation, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. And so if God is calling us to this, he's going he's gonna to put everything in place for us to be able to do it. So I would encourage you, if you want to come, come be a part of that. Two o'clock in the back building. Um, let's just close with a word of prayer. I am so grateful. Thank you. Doris and, and Karen, thank you so much, uh, Dave, for sharing. Um, I feel like there's this whole new vista that has opened up in front of me. Father, I thank you this day that you are so big. God, that you know everything there is to know all the time that nothing escapes your attention, nothing surprises you, nothing sneaks up on you, nothing gets by you. You know everything. I thank you, Father, that when you call us, you equip us, that you give us what we need, even if it's just in the moment we need it. I thank you that, Father, we can trust you. 
And so, Father, I, I, I bless Doris, Karen, Dave. I ask, Father, that you would bless them and the work that they're doing on your behalf. I ask, Father, that you would lead their ministries. I ask, Father, that you would lead our ministry. That, God, you would take us step by step to show us how to do those things that I believe that you are calling us to. Father, I'm, I'm, I'm one man. I'm limited in my knowledge, my understanding, my experience. But that makes me trust you. Yeah. And so, Father, I am asking that you would do a mighty work. You are a big God, and I want to see big things done in your name. And I ask, God, that you would lead us into those things. We bless you today, Father, because you are so good. We thank you for your mercy, your grace, your faithfulness, your love. I thank you, Father, for the body of Christ that, that becomes our extended family. Uh, Father, even as your son said, that if we give up father, mother, husband, wife, children, that we get, shall gain a hundredfold more in this life and in the life to come. And I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ and, and, and for getting to meet new ones uh, this weekend. I thank you, Father. We bless you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, we're going to break for lunch, and if you would uh, like to come and participate, like I said, we'll be in the activities. God bless you.